Hi, welcome back to Jesus Up Close, our study of the Gospel of John. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel, and this is part six of our series. If you want to track the entire Gospel of John, just go to the Jesus Up Close playlist. Today, the title of the message is Jesus, Hero Jesus, How Jesus Liberates Our Hearts. Our text is John chapter 2. We're going to see Jesus collide, confront the religious systems of oppression of his day and our day. And so I hope today's message will encourage you. Journey with us verse by verse through John's Gospel. We love to have heroes, and I'm sure everybody in the room has a hero. Maybe a fictional hero that was like your favorite hero, you know, in all the fictional stories growing up. Maybe a real life hero. But when I count to three, I want you to say the name of your hero. Ready? Ready? Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay. Very good. I caught Jesus and somebody else. Um, everybody has heroes. We, we live in a world that loves to celebrate heroes. Let me do a little quick survey. How many Marvel fans are in the room? Marvel. Marvel Cinematic Universe. Okay. Okay, so you guys got lots of heroes. I mean, any problem there is, there's a hero that fits that particular need. Um, let's move on to Star Wars. Star Wars fans in the room. Okay, wow, energetic too. Um, Star Wars, who's the hero in Star Wars? Yeah, Luke is the only one I know, but I'm sure there's others. You know, it's, I get, Yoda, okay. I get confused because uh, it, anyway, the prequel, sequel, all that timeline. I wish they'd just make them in order. Okay, um, DC Comics? Yeah, it's like two, okay, three, okay, that's what I thought. Um, how many of you would say hobbits are my heroes? You're just really into the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, okay, a number of those, okay. Um, okay, how about Harry Potter? He's, he's you're here, okay. So um, all of these fictional narratives, if I missed yours, I truly apologize. There's probably somebody out there going, what about Jack Bauer? Okay, whatever. Um, we love to celebrate heroes. We aspire, frankly, to be heroes to, to those we love. And like we would have our fictional heroes, we probably all have our real life heroes. We probably could all point to somebody who stepped into our life providentially at the right time, the right moment, and helped us significantly. And we would consider them heroes in our lives. They're people we esteem or we aspire to be like. We celebrate them. And deep within us all, every one of us, if we could peel back the layers of our heart, we hope there is an ultimate cosmic hero to fix all the messes. We long for that. Um, we long for a hero not only to fix the mess that we call planet Earth, about the time we thought we were coming out of the mess, we got into a bigger one. Did you notice that? Planet Earth is a mess. But we don't just need someone to fix the mess around us. We also know when we're in our most honest places, we know that we need someone to fix the mess that is within us. The messes we make in our own lives, uh, the messes in terms of the struggles we have to live up to the, the person we truly hope to be or become. And so we live around with a, we're surrounded by a mess and we have a mess within us as well. And I'm so excited about today because today we get to see the great hero of all time. And we get to see Jesus emerge as a hero in a way that's probably gonna surprise you. And I get to have the fun, wonderful, awesome job of standing before you every week and introducing you to my hero and my best friend, Jesus. Now I wanna tell you as a sidebar, my primary objective as a pastor and a teacher is to interpret and represent scripture faithfully to you. I, I try to use stories and illustrations and objects and pictures and things, but when it's all said and done, the goal is you walk out of here understanding the Bible more, more clearly, more faithfully to the heart of God, um, because that's gonna change your life. Um, not my being a, a, an engaging communicator as much as faithful to the scriptures because John's trying to give us truth, we've established that, so that we would believe that truth 
and experience through that truth a relationship of love with our God. Okay, a relationship of love with our God. A flourishing, joyful, celebratory, couldn't have chosen a better song that the choir sang right before the message. A a song that celebrates God because that is the true nature and true heart of the gospels, or of the gospel. And I will tell you the passage that before us is today, John chapter two, beginning in verse 12. It's one of the more misunderstood passages in all of scripture. Jesus steps a bit out of character as we expect him to be in this story. This, what he's gonna do in this next story, he does twice in his ministry. Once when he begins his ministry, which is now, and once the very last week of his life. We call it the cleansing of the temple. Today, that gentle, mild Jesus that religious structures have handed us, we're gonna see him through a different lens. He's gonna get angry. He's going to get aggressive. He's going to make a whip and chase people out of the temple. It's going to be awesome. Okay, because, well, it just is. This is awesome, okay. This is better than any Marvel movie, okay. When the hero sweeps in, brings sweeping destruction on evil, and saves the day for planet Earth, this is better. Are you ready? I don't, I, you're not convincing me that I'm convincing you. Okay, but I want you to talk through the story. I want to talk through the story, teach through it, which is the longer part of the message, and at the very end, three applicational takeaways, okay? But I want you to journey with me in your mind, in your heart, into this story. We need to pretend we're first century Israelites. I need to get you there culturally, contextually, because if you don't get there culturally and contextually, you'll completely misunderstand what Jesus is doing. You'll walk away with some kind of moralistic idea that you shouldn't sell books at church. Uh, something, you know, something weird uh, and, and about, you know, oh, we should just be somber at church. That's not at all what this passage is getting at. So let's read it. So verse 11 is where we left off last week. The beginning of miracles, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Verse 11 is, Jesus is awesome. And everybody that was with him believed, really began to invest their hearts and trust. Verse 12, after this, this was after the wedding. Remember, last week, Jesus saved the day at the wedding feast and created the wine and, and saved the feast and saved the shame for the groom. A wonderful story we celebrated last week. So now, after this, verse 12, he went down to Capernaum, small fishing village right on the north shore of Galilee, half day's walk from where he was. Remember, he's up in the fertile, uh, lush, agrarian northern part of Israel. And he's going to stay at Capernaum only for a few days, and then he's going to go south, and he's going to be gone from Galilee for almost a year. He's not going to come back to Capernaum for a long time, but when he does, he's going to kind of home base at Capernaum, which is pretty cool. By later in the book, we're going to spend a lot of time at Capernaum. But he leaves Capernaum, it says, in, uh, in verse 12. And his mother and his brethren and his disciples, they continued there not many days. Just a few days in this little village. Verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, we need to break down verse 13, okay? What is Passover? What does that mean? Well, The Passover was an event in Israel's history where God spared the lives of the firstborn based on the faith of the family that that slew the or sacrificed a lamb, took the blood of that lamb and put it on their doorposts as an expression of faith and trust in God for salvation. So it it was a picture of the gospel. It was a picture of what Jesus would one day do. But that night, everybody who were covered by the blood of the lamb, was spared, okay? Now, you can already connect the dots because in chapter one, John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God and pointed to Jesus. So that it immediately connected, oh, he's gonna become to all of humanity what that lamb was on that night of Passover to save the lives. So this man is gonna become God's lamb for me to save my life. That's the connection. Well, the Passover was such a, 
an epic event and such a forward-pointing event to ultimately what Jesus would do on the cross that God established a feast, a celebration called Passover, okay? And this feast was to take place where the tabernacle and eventually the temple was, and ultimately that was Jerusalem, okay? So Jerusalem was the capital city. The temple, I need you to kind of create a category in your mind right now, and and I'm going to try to keep out of the deep weeds, but you got to go with me. The temple, the word temple is conceptually, here's what it is, where God and man meet, okay? Conceptually, that's all it is, okay? It's where God and man meet. So the point of a temple, going all the way back to ancient Israel, is God said to ancient Israel, I'm going to show myself to all of the world through you. And the first thing I'm going to do is dwell among you. As you come out of Egypt, I'm going to dwell among you as your God, as your leader. But there's a problem. There's something that separates us, and it's called sin. You can't approach me and I can't approach you because you are guilty of breaking my laws. Doesn't cause me to love you any less, and I'm a God of mercy and long suffering, but still, sin stands between us and separates us. This is what God wants all of humanity to know. This is still the message all the way through the New Testament. I come into this life, sin passes from generation to generation, and that's what's wrong with planet Earth. You're sinful, I'm sinful, it's not simply one thing we did wrong, it is in us. It's like systemic. It grows in us, okay? Sin is like a cancer, and it's in everybody, and it's in all of creation. So God said, because of sin, I can dwell among you, near you, but not really with you. So that's what the temple is going to be. The temple is going to be representative of my presence with you, but your separation from me. And then he said, there's going to be a way you can approach me. There's gonna be a way you can come to me and know me and celebrate me and experience me. Now remember, in the the vernacular of God, experiencing him and his generosity and his goodness and his lavish love is what mankind was created for. It's what we most long for. It's what you are longing for in, in all of your achievements and all of your performance and all of your efforts at life to succeed, to thrive, to flourish. You're really looking for blessings that God really wants to give, okay? Now, the world system says, no, you have to work, work for them. You have to earn them. But God wants to give them. And, and going all the way back in time, it was God's heart to give them. Well, sin came in between. So God said, I'm going to take care of sin, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to rescue you, reclaim you. But but I can't just forget about sin. It's there. It's real. It needs to be dealt with, okay? It's it's, it's kind of like when I had cancer. If I just said, well, if I forget about it, it'll go away. No, it won't. It has to be dealt with. It has to be killed, okay? So God says, because I'm good, because I'm generous, because I'm loving, because I'm perfect, because I'm lavish in my love, I hate evil, and I'm going to kill evil, And there's this work I'm going to do in the future. I'm going to send a Savior, and he's going to do a work, a sacrificial work, a suffering work. He's going to kill evil. And until he does that, we're going to create a picture of that. So I want you to take a perfect animal, a lamb or some other kind of animal. I want you to take a perfect animal, and I want you to bring it to the temple, and I want you to offer that freely to me. It's going to be, I'm going to give you enough animals that you can sacrifice, and you can still live off the others, and you can take the best one. Now, there will be lots of good ones, but take the best one and come to me, and when you come to me, sacrifice that animal, and the blood that flows is going to picture, it's going to be a picture to you that sin has to die, that the only way to forgive sin is if it is dead, if it is destroyed. And so the death of that animal is going to picture a coming death of a coming Savior. And when you present your sacrifice at the temple, it's going to be a picture or an expression that you are trusting my mercy and my grace to experience me and to know me. And you're not trusting your own religious performance or good work. It's an expression of faith. So God instituted this system that for hundreds of years was alive in Jerusalem. 
And one of the times of the year they would come to do this is called the Passover. Now here's the beautiful thing. After they offered their sacrifice, the Passover was a week of festive, jubilant celebration. Very much like the wedding feast we talked about last week, okay? It was all a picture. In fact, God instituted three feasts, three times a year, where all the nation of Israel would come together like a giant family reunion. Think of, in 21st century America, think of 4th of July. The whole country is dressed in red, white, and blue, waving flags, uh, grilling hot dogs, getting together with friends, and, and enjoying fireworks. You know what I'm talking about? It's awesome, right? Christmas, Easter, we celebrate three or four, Thanksgiving, we all get together, we eat way too much. This was Passover. It was first, deal with sin, and then secondly, enjoy God, because he's so generous and he's so good and he's so lavish. We're gonna celebrate him all week as a family. So, the temple, the feasts, the sacrifice was all supposed to be a source of joy. It was supposed to be an invitation into the heart of God. It was supposed to be feasting at God's table with God's people, with all of my friends, being received and loved and cherished and blessed by God. Now, it became something else. But let me take you there physically, geographically. I've got some pictures to show you guys, okay? So, and I even have a pointer with a red dot. You guys got the red dot? Follow the bouncing ball. Okay, I'll try not to make you sick. If you're listening just the audio of the message, I apologize, you can't see the pictures. But here we go. Um, This is a modern day picture of Jerusalem from the air, okay? Or part of Jerusalem. Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane, down the hill. This is a valley called the Kidron Valley. This is where Jesus walked the last night of his life. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, then he was arrested and taken to Caiaphas' house, which is over here. Uh, And so anyway, uh, this is, Jerusalem extends out here onto a peninsula of land. Jesus has come into Jerusalem from the Jordan Valley to Jericho, up through the desert, which is way over here, up through the mountains to the top of the Mount of Olives. He's looking down on this scene. This is Temple Mount, okay? Temple Mount, it's now... a a mosque, but it's Temple Mount. This is the southern wall. The steps that would have walked up to the temple are here. Western wall is right here. Huge, huge area. Jesus would have walked down Mount of Olives, around this valley, to the Pool of uh, Siloam, which is down here, where they would have cleansed and washed. Then they would have come up through town to the temple, and he gets into the temple. Now, I'm I'm gonna take this view We're gonna go a little lower and a little bit to the left, and we're gonna go back 2,000 years, and this is what it would have looked like in Jesus' day. So I want you to go there in your mind, okay? So we're looking at the same basic view. Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane, Kidron Valley is over this little ridge, comes around a peninsula of land, and now you have the southern steps of the temple, and you have what's called Solomon's Porch, and uh, Western Wall is here, huge. This place is gigantic, okay? Uh, the only thing I can compare it to is 21st century. You get in a subway, go down to Lower Manhattan, come up out of the ground, and Freedom Tower, boom, that imposing structure, okay? This was a dominant part of the city, and it was what everybody came to enjoy, and the idea was God is good, and he's with us, and he's accessible, Okay, next picture, real quick, we've got a few more. So this is looking from the Garden of Gethsemane up towards the eastern wall of modern day uh, temple grounds, okay? Um, Now, if I put you in a drone and went straight up into the air from that spot and went back 2,000 years, it would have looked like this. So now we're looking the other direction, into Jerusalem. You can see Solomon's porch, You can see this area is called the Court of the Gentiles. Uh, This is the main part of the temple. This is a Roman fortress where soldiers were stationed. Herod's palace was out over here. Garden of Gethsemane, Kedron Valley. So this was a a huge, huge area. Go to the next one, please, the next photo. This is a model of the same space, uh, almost the same view, just just a little differently uh, positioned. It's a scale model of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Now, I want you to remember 
this courtyard in your mind and these porticos around the temple, okay? Because that's where Jesus is gonna walk into next. Go to the next sh shot real quick. So this is a shot I took a few weeks ago of Temple Mount. I want you to understand, this is like the size of 15 football fields. It is a huge, flat area on the top of Mount Moriah where Abraham first went to offer Isaac. So that's what it looks like today. Now, with that view in mind, we're gonna walk with Jesus into the temple grounds. You guys still with me? Verse 14, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and the changers of money sitting. Now, I have in the room with me those that sell oxen, sheep, doves, and changers of money. So if you are among those, would you please come to the platform? All of the sellers of oxen, uh, sheep, and doves, and changers of money, okay? Here they come. These are the bad guys, in case you're wondering, okay? Derek bailed out on us. He hurt his ankle, so he's trying to stay innocent today. So these are the guys, and lots of them, by the way. I need you to, in, that, in your mind, in that court area, the court of the Gentiles, imagine the most chaotic flea market you've ever walked through, okay? Imagine a gigantic bazaar, a marketplace full of haggling and bartering and trading, and money changing. Now what's going on here? Because we gotta understand the, the context and the history. I already said, this was supposed to be a festive, jubilant, everybody's invited kind of celebration. You bring your own sacrifice, what you've raised, what you have, uh, what God's blessed you with, and you bring it to the temple. So if you're paying attention, there's already a problem in your mind. There's already a little warning light on your dashboard when you read there are those that sell oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money. Now, let me just ask you a very intuitive question, church. <clears throat> Is it possible to buy my way to God? No. Is it possible to perform or behave my way to God? No. So here's what these guys have done. You guys take a step forward. We're gonna let this platform represent the temple. We, you and I, we're all first century Israelites. We're all in town for Passover feast. You've all brought your sacrifices. I've, I've got my little children and my wife and I've got a lamb that we've brought and I've been teaching them on the way to Jerusalem. I've been singing psalms and teaching them about Abraham and the Passover and teaching them why this lamb and why the blood and, and God's gonna deal with our sins and we're guilty before him but he still loves us and he wants to atone for our sins. He wants to remove our guilt and shame because he's just and good and after, after he atones for our sins, uh, we're gonna be welcomed into his love and celebrate and feast and joy in him all week long. It's gonna be wonderful and by the way, this system uh, the blood of goats and lambs and, and sacrifices doesn't take away sin. It just temporarily covered it until Jesus came to take it away. It's, you understand this. Most of you have a credit card. When you, if you go to lunch today and you use your credit card, is the meal paid for? It's a trick question, isn't it? Yes and no. It's paid for, it's covered. The credit card says, we'll cover this. But you, you're, unless you're delusional, you're thinking in the back of your mind, the bill is coming due, right? So careful thought process is I don't want to overuse this card beyond my ability to pay. All right, here's the problem. We've all sinned far beyond our ability to pay. And religious systems insert themselves between you and God and say, pay up. The whole message of God from the beginning of time is, you can't pay, so I will. You see, so the system didn't pay for the sin, it covered it like a credit card until Jesus came as the ultimate savior, the final lamb, and the, the whole bill, the full bill, fell on him. That's why the Bible calls him the propitiation. It's why he said on the cross, it is finished. The word was a financial term, paid in full. You see, religion says, you need to pay for your sins. But the gospel says, 
Jesus is the only one, and he's already paid for your sins. Okay, so what's happening on these temple grounds is, is a total perversion of the original idea. So here we are in Jerusalem, I've got my lamb, you've got your offering and your family and your feast, you're ready to feast, and, and here I come with my little kids and my wife, and I come to the court of the Gentiles with my offering, step a little forward this way guys, and here they are, security, priests and religious leaders, they stop me, they metal detect me, they take your shoes and your belt off, they put in my bags, they check my luggage, they're not gonna let me through, hold up. The first thing they do is they make me exchange my money. I'm coming from all over the empire with different coinage and different money and it's all in their eyes unclean. None of it's acceptable. So they're already telling me my money's no good. Okay, so I have to exchange my money with them and they've added a surcharge, like 30%. Okay, so already this party is no fun. You can begin to feel the weight, okay? So now I gotta change my money because they won't take my other money and I can't use my other money around the temple. They've, they've, they've set up boundaries that only certain things are acceptable. So they, they're making millions of dollars on exchanging the money. And, and so the, finally I exchange the money. That's a huge burden. I gotta save for that and plan for that. But now I've got my lamb and they stop me. So I, wait, I need to go offer my lamb. So can I get through? Why not? It's not acceptable. What do you mean? It's perfect. Mm. This is the best one I had. We've been raising this lamb. My children start to cry. Well, what's wrong with it? Why, why is it not? A, it's not spotless. It is spotless. Unflinching, unbending, legalistic, oppressive. You're not good enough. Your offering's not good enough. So what, am I banished? So I take the lamb, I take my children, I, I walk back, I set the lamb, and I say, kids, we can't give that one to God. But daddy, that's the one we wanted to give to God. Well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, what am I supposed to do, guys? I'm commanded to offer, I, I brought my family, we wanna bring a sacrifice to our God. I want you to catch this. They are obstructing my way to God. The, the way that God intended to be clear, they've, they've blocked it up. So what, what, what do I do? How do I offer to my God? We've got more we can sell you. Oh, oh you're going to sell me an animal? I have to buy an animal? Yeah. Oh, so they've got a racket going. You see the scam? In a place called Bethlehem, they had like a sheep factory. No kidding. That's an interesting side thought. Bethlehem of all places. The temple lambs were raised at Bethlehem. And they hired a whole subculture of people to raise and farm thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sacrificial animals so that when I get from Nazareth with my lamb and they could arbitrarily reject my offering and I set it down, then they're gonna take the money they just extorted me in exchanging and say, now you gotta buy one of our lambs and they're gonna upcharge that significantly, kind of like a bottle of soda at a theme park. So they're taking this supposed act of grace and mercy of me giving to God from the abundance of what he's blessed me with out of love and Humility and repentance, saying, God, I realize I'm sinful and I'm offering this to you as an expression of my faith in your one day lamb sacrifice. And then God saying, welcome home to my heart, celebrate and feast and enjoy my goodness. Now, this place has turned into a circus. It is an oppressive blockade. And they're saying, you get to God through us. You guys can be seated. It's a travesty. 
Well, what is Jesus going to do? I should have I held these guys up here because the next verse is when the whip comes in. <laughs> he made a scourge. I just want you to feel in verse 14 the boiling, passionate love of Jesus. When he sees the self-proclaimed leaders perverting his system and extorting his people for every cent. And I'm not talking about a little bit of money. They turned this temple into Fort Knox. Millions and millions and millions of dollars being amassed in the wealth and control of a small handful of religious elite in Jerusalem that are in league with Roman authorities. And here's the other thing, I didn't get to say this, these poor people have already been taxed already too much by the Roman tyranny. So now Romans have taxed them and now religion's gonna tax them and make them buy their way to God and Jesus is seething, why? Because they're obstructing people from his grace. What angers Jesus? Any system that puts you into oppression and keeps you from experiencing God's mercy and grace and love. So let's keep reading. Verse 15, he makes a scourge of small cords. It's kind of like a small whip. And he drove them out of the temple. Notice he didn't harm anybody, but he scared them to death. I wish I could, I can't wait to see that on video. Jesus, in a, me, in, in a measured, premeditated, calculated response, says, get out of my house. Just like you would if somebody came into your house to victimize your children, how aggressive would you get? I don't wanna know, you're Smith and Wesson, I don't wanna know what, you know, how aggressive you would, wouldn't it be a whip with small cords, I guarantee you, this is Connecticut. Hey, why? Because that's what passionate love does, that's what fiery love does, and Jesus drives them out. He drives the people out, and then he drives the animals, sheep, oxen, it's as if to say, you don't need to buy these animals. Number one, your offering is enough. But number two, I'm gonna be the offering. I am the lamb. I'm here now. I am the lamb. I am this temple. His disciples remembered, verse 17, that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews, the Jewish leaders, whose tables and money has all been strewn about and whose power now has been brought into question. They come to Jesus and they say in verse 18, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Hey, show us a supernatural miracle that proves to us you have the authority to do what you just did. That's what they're saying. They're confronting him, they're angry. Who, who gives you the right to do what you just did? But look what Jesus says. Here's the sign I'm gonna show you. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then, said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building and you're gonna rear it up in three days? They start to scorn him. They start to mock him. They don't even understand what he's referring to. But remember, the word temple, it's not about a building. It's about a principle, it's about an idea, it's about a concept, and the concept is where man and God meet. So you tell me, do the math. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in this moment, what is the temple? Jesus. The bricks and stone building behind him and around him is just a building now. He is the temple. And John tells us that. He says in the next verse, then, uh, verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. Then when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. Jesus is saying, here's the sign I'm gonna give you. You guys are gonna crucify me. You're gonna nail me to a cross. You're gonna destroy this temple that I'm occupying right now, this body, but I'm gonna raise it up in three days. That's gonna be your sign. By the way, they're still not gonna believe. Look at verse 23. Now, so after this hubbub, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, 
Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, I need about 10 minutes to give you the takeaways. That's the story. Hero Jesus smashes the system and saves the day, okay? What does it mean? Here it is, number one. You guys with me? All right, Jesus crushes the legalistic systems of religion. They had their version, but we have ours by the dozens. Any system that stands between you and God, any man that says you gotta go th through me to get to God, pay up, live up to it, perform up to it, any system that stands between you and Jesus with its arms folded and its eyes frowned, comparing you, measuring you, analyzing you, taking stock of you to see if you're good enough to come through the system to be accepted of God, that is a system that Jesus hates. Because that's what he was doing that day. He was destroying that system or initiating the destruction of that system. They cleaned it all up, put it all back together, and he does it again in three years, okay? But the system that stands between you and God, listen, in these systems, pictures of grace become pressures on the people, pressures and gain to the priest. In other words, these little lambs and these sacrifices are supposed to be awesome, it's supposed to be wonderful opportunities to show, show and express love to God, but these guys made, made it a pressure system a pressure cooker you had to live up to, you had to buy your way through, you had, to, you had to perform your way through, you had to be good enough. Pressures that just resulted in their gain, an exploitation of people maneuvering and manipulating their fear and their guilt and their shame and saying, the only way for you to, to get to God is to pay through our system. It's totally oppressive. The place of mercy, the temple, the place where God was supposed to meet man and experience his mercy, became a powerhouse of money. The people, this is so sad, the people of ministry, the priests, were supposed to be shepherds. They were supposed to be helping the people understand God's heart, helping the people understand God's generosity. And they became obstructors of God. They became roadblocks to God. So the people of ministry became power brokers strictly for their own profit. Hey, I don't have time to unfold this. This is alive and well all over America. It, it goes by different names and different denominations and different tribes and different groups, but a lot of it calls itself Christian. Legalism, legalistic, is anytime you are taught that you have to relate to God on the basis of your goodness or your works or your performance. And it always results in comparative, competitive, trying to live up to God. It always makes God an oppressor, a greedy, stingy oppressor. And the system that stands between you, you've got to break through that system, hopefully live up to it and be good enough to get to God that's called legalism, relating to God on the basis of your goodness. But the whole temple system, the whole Passover, the whole idea was that I can't relate to God because of my goodness. I can only relate to him because of his goodness, mercy, forgiveness. But that got so obscured in the system. We don't pay for salvation or our relationship with God. We don't work. We don't have to prove our worth to God. And some, listen, some of you have grown up in a system that that's the only view of God you got. Whatever it was called, Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, is the only view of God you got was you gotta be good enough. And no wonder people run from him. Who can live up to that? Just envision hero Jesus chasing the system out of your life so that you could be embraced in the arms of God's mercy and grace. Learn a different view of God. Don't walk away from him. Reject the God you were given and embrace the God who is. Embrace the true God revealed in scripture who is so often obscured 
in the pulpits of America. Boy, I'm punchy today, aren't I? (laughs) Number two, Jesus completes a picture of grace relationship. When the religious leaders confront Jesus and said, show us a sign, here's here's the tragic thing. You're gonna see in a minute, he does plenty of signs. They don't wanna see a sign. And so his answer is is generally a rebuke, but it's a profound rebuke. It's a prophetic rebuke, and it's a meaningful rebuke to you and me. He says, it's almost as though he's saying, you're not gonna believe any sign, so let me tell you the ultimate sign I'm gonna show you. When you kill me, I'm gonna raise from the dead. In that, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of the system. I am the lamb, I am the temple. I'm the proprietor of this place, I'm the personification of this place. I'm the prophesied Messiah, predicting my own death and resurrection. I'm the personification of all of the pictures of mercy and grace. In all of the Old Testament, Jesus says, here I am, I'm the fulfillment of all of it. And they hated him because of it. Now the common people, the regular everyday Joes, Can you imagine how happy this guy with his lamb and his little kids was when Jesus drove those guys out? I wonder if Jesus looked at this guy and went, grab that lamb, he'll be fine. Why don't you guys come over and sit down with me? I'm, I'm conjecturing a bit, but I'm telling you, this would have been every bit as fleshed out and real as what I'm sharing to you, and more so. Because thirdly, not only did Jesus complete the picture of love and grace that they had so missed, but thirdly, He commends radical, unconditional love, verses 23 through 25. Look at what happens. He's in Jerusalem on the Passover, in the feast. Many believed, why? When they saw the miracles which he did. Do you wanna know what happened after he drove out the bad guys? He sat down in the temple and all the normal people around him just kinda gathered around and he started healing them and doing miracles, and blessing them, and loving them. It's like, welcome to my house. Now that we got rid of the bad guys, we can celebrate my love and forgiveness. And by the way, your offerings are enough because they point to faith in my offering, and I'm enough. And so he starts doling out miracle after me. Contrast these guys, you're not enough, exchange the money, buy an animal, you're still not good. I mean, the stringent force of the system in contrast to the extravagant generosity of Jesus. And people believe and receive. But look at what it says in verse 24 and 25. Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knows what was in man. You know what? I can't spend much time here, but here's the simple point. Jesus is healing and blessing people that are believing in him. Some of them genuinely believe, and some of them are just believing for what they think he can bring them. A better life, more stuff. Oh, I want want to be on this guy's team. He drove off the money changers. In other words, mixed motives. But did Jesus go through the crowd going, okay, your motives are good, I'll heal you and love you, but your motives are bad, get out of here. No. He ministered to everybody indiscriminately, generously, lovingly, even though he knew some of them would have exploited him, would have supplanted God's plan through him. So much here, my friends. The big takeaway is, unbelievers, if you have... Never, if you've been trying to work and earn your way to God, if you think being here today gives you God's favor, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Nothing you do can earn God's favor. You can come only on the basis of Jesus and faith and trust in him. And that's where the relationship with God begins. But believers, listen, we, you and me, we default in our minds. Even though we're saved by grace, we default right back to, but I gotta live up to God's demands. 
instead of living out of his love. Living up to God's demands will flatten you. You will quit. You will walk away. You will resent God. But you will have misunderstood the whole thing. You can't do it. Living out of God's love, Ephesians 2 says, we are his workmanship, created unto good works. Oh, you'll still bring an offering to God, but you'll do it because you want to, not because you have to. You'll still serve and love, but you'll do it out of an abundant heart of, I love God. Who wouldn't? Instead of, like the people coming to Jerusalem, got to exchange our money, got to buy offerings, got to do all this stuff. This is a terrible, terrible experience. They had turned the best feast of the year into the worst week of the year. How do you view God? Is he a hero that sets you free from hard work? Because that's who he really is. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. God, thank you so much for the hero that Jesus is. We are saved by his work and grace and love and nothing else. Well, when you come to Jesus Christ, he breaks your heart free from the oppression of performance, from having to live up to your salvation to earn his love or favor. He breaks you free from religious systems that set up a performance-based love. Friend, the love of Jesus Christ is unconditional and is reaching out to you. I hope you will receive that love as the source of your salvation. Trust Jesus as Savior if you've never trusted him. And if you have, I hope that you will grow up in that love and trust him every day of your life because his love is good. He truly is the hero. He truly does liberate our hearts. Thanks for joining me for part six of the Gospel of John. We'll see you in part seven.